Hi, Big Anklevich here with our special guest, Mr. Sean Connery. Please, call me Sean. Your mother did. Excuse me? Well, I'm sorry. Must have been your sister. Right. And we're here to talk about the audio market list. Yes, that's over at www.audiomarketlist.com, you Nancy boy. Sean, is that really appropriate? It's uh, Sean to you, you sideburnless flathead. You know, I don't even think you're the real Sean Connery. <laughs> yeah, Aunt Judy didn't complain. Okay, <laughs> Sean, please leave. That's okay, we've actually got a few special guests here on hand. So, uh, Jimmy Stewart is here with us, actually. Jimmy, would you like to continue reading the script? Well, well, well sure, Biggie. I'd be honored. The audio market list is a swell collection of fiction markets out on the internet who will buy authors' work and podcast it in both paying and non-paying formats. In fact... Uh, would... um, I've just been handed a note informing me that Jimmy Stewart passed away in 1997. I'm terribly sorry, folks. Jimmy, out. I, I can't help being... Next up. Oh, Christopher Walken is here. Christopher. I'll uh, just pick up where things were left off. It also includes links to writing workshops, author associations, and even genre conventions, which sound, I have to admit, very attractive. Uh, I'm starting to think you're somebody doing a Walken impersonation, mister. A bad one, too. Out, please. Oh, 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 here we have uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Will you continue, please? Of course, Big Anklevich. The AML won a truly useful site award from predators and editors. And why not? It is the premier market list exclusively dedicated to audio fiction markets. Visit it once and you'll be back. Uh, you know, you don't even look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm not. Oh, Wallace Shawn is here. Wallace, can you finish up the script? Of course. With frequent updates about contests, new markets, and newsworthy notes from fiction audio sources, it's inconceivable you wouldn't go there immediately. You know, that impression is demeaning to us both. I'm Morgan, sorry. Morgan Freeman. Thank you, Big Anklevich. It's free, with no membership required. I'd say I liked the audio market list from the beginning. It had a quiet way about it, a way of walking and talking. Oh, oh, a fake Al Pacino? Oh, it is beautiful. It's bilingual, available in English and Canadian, and guaranteed to have absolutely no MSG. hoo Folks, there's been a mistake somewhere. Literally none of these celebrity voices seem to be genuine. But the audio market list is Autobots. Whoa. Optimus Prime. Check it out on the web at www.audiomarketlist.com. Tell them Prime sent you. Now transform and... Oh, can I say it? By all means, transform and roll out. <laughs> You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, Rish Outfield, Big Anklevich, and O8OT. Howdy, stranger. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 2, page 81. Nice to see you around these parts again. I'm Rish Outfield, as you know. And I'm Big Anklevich the Kid. <laughs> Sorry. No, how are we going to refer to the damn robot, so I'm not going to. That robot doesn't exist, not in these parts. We don't cotton to robots around here. You'll have to wait outside. Your droids, we don't want their type here. <laughs> Cheers, guys. And that's the uh, announcer man. Couldn't you do a, some kind of accent just to set the mood, announcer man? No! Well, thanks for doing your part, partner. Uh, he sort of knocked me off my stride here with the whole accent thing. Sorry, man. Do you man. think I can get it back? No. All right. Well, I will shuffle on. Shuffle on? Mosey. Mosey. I will, yes, I will mosey on. Thank you. Today's episode is... 
casts a demon shadow by Derek J. Goodman. Derek J. Goodman was born and raised in Wisconsin. And despite several attempts to leave, he always finds himself drawn back to the state. In addition to previous stories on the Dune Steve, his work has recently appeared at Oddlands Magazine, Revolution SF, and Glassfire Magazine. For more of his work, you can get a free PDF of his collection, Things of Loose Reality, by visiting lulu.com slash Derek J. Goodman. When not writing, Derek spends his free time doing community theater, where he has a disturbing tendency to either be the guy in the dress or the guy in the straitjacket. Uh huh? Also, special thanks to Julie Hoberson for doing a voice on today's episode. She rocks and rolls, folks. Cast a Demon Shadow by Derek J. Goodman. Every man who ever entered the Thirsty Ox Saloon took his turn imagining what it would be like to bed Cassandra Grant. Yet none ever talked to her. She was always drunk by mid-afternoon, and to someone unfamiliar with Ogre Ridge, it might have seemed easy to take advantage of her. But outsiders rarely came to town. The last one who'd shown up had been a young buck the Harrimans had been dumb enough to hire as help at their ranch. He thought he was quite irresistible, too. And when he'd first seen Cassie at the bar wearing her ripped wedding dress, he'd obviously thought he'd found an easy notch to add to his bedpost. Even though she had been drunk enough that she couldn't keep her eyes uncrossed, Cassie had still been able to remove both of the man's ears with one shot each from her fiancé's colts. Cassie wore the dress for the first six months after her aborted wedding. She caused quite a scandal, too even if Ogre Ridge was hardly what one could consider a normal town. The residents still weren't warm to a perpetually drunk woman in a wrecked wedding dress. And she smelled. Even the men who had to routinely shovel horse shit at the ranches had to comment on her foul odor. Apparently, according to the Carter's maid, Cassie never removed the dress for anything. She rode her horse in it. She spilled booze all over it. She slept in it. She had put it on for her wedding and hadn't taken it off. She'd even worn it to Randall's funeral. Cassie had only been about seven when Ogre Ridge had changed forever, so she barely remembered the town being anything other than what it was now. Just because she'd never known a life without magic, though, didn't mean she wanted anything to do with it. That had been one of the things she'd loved about Randall. He may have belonged to one of the two most powerful necromancer families in all of Ogre Ridge, but... He had the magical aptitude of a potato sack. Once you came to Ogre Ridge, close tabs were kept on you for fear that you might spread the secret to the rest of the Colorado Territory. So she would never know what a normal life might be like. Randall would have been the closest to that life that she would ever come. Now, it was just another pile of ashes spread out on Boot Hill. The fact that running around in nothing but a wedding dress was anything but normal never occurred to her alcohol-addled brain. Cassie's feelings about magic were well known to everyone, and they knew not to use it around her. If you use magic to give yourself a handful of aces in a game of cards, your opponent might very well enchant your voice to sound like a cowbell. But if Cassie was in the vicinity, she would likely give the cheater a pair of extra holes in his backside. That was why, as Cassie polished off yet another shot of whiskey on a Friday night, everyone grew quiet when Pa Carter entered the saloon and took a seat next to Cassie. Everyone knew Franklin Pa Carter, but most only knew him by reputation. He wasn't quite as elusive as the matron of the Harriman family, but that didn't do much to take away from his air of mystery. No one ever saw him without his Stetson even though no one ever saw him outside, either. His expensive gray suits were always coated in dust, like he'd been riding at the tail end of a cattle drive, yet no one ever saw him actually do any work for himself. No one had ever seen him on a horse, and no one had ever before seen him set foot in the thirsty ox. Many of the town's cowboys had just returned from a cattle drive, so the thirsty ox was as full as it would ever get. 
Once Pa Carter stepped in, however, half the clientele stepped out. Although not without spitting in his general direction, there wasn't a person among the Harriman family and their hands that wouldn't have loved to put a bullet in his silver-haired head right there. But not a one was stupid enough to think they would live to get the shot off. It was much simpler just to leave and show him minor disrespect on the way out. Pa didn't pay any of them any mind. All his concentration was on Cassie. Cassandra, I think it's about time we had a chat, he said. He motioned for the bartender to pour him a drink, and the bartender did so while trying to keep his hand from shaking. Cassie didn't answer him. Instead, she took his drink from in front of him, downed it in one gulp, then placed the glass upside down in front of him again. Pa smiled at the glass and motioned for the bartender to pour him another one. This time, he kept it well out of reach. Perhaps we should have this conversation somewhere more private, he said. I ain't leaving this stool, she said. And all the damn Harrimans are gone. Ain't nothing you could say to me that can't be said in front of anyone here. Everyone else in the saloon was pretending like they couldn't hear, but more than a few people shuddered at her comment. Whether Pa was the patriarch of their clan or not, no one ever wanted to become even remotely involved in his personal business. All right then, Cassie, if that's how you want it. Pa's voice was smooth and gentle. It reminded Cassie of her grandfather, except for the hint of barely controlled anger that never left his voice. I know you loved Randall. It isn't like there was anyone who didn't. And we all need time to mourn him. Although that wouldn't be necessary if you had just let us bring him back like we do to... Cassie burped. There weren't no way I was going to let you turn him into one of your soulless marauders. Pa paused. Cassie was pretty sure he was debating whether or not to kill her for talking back. But she didn't much care. Then Pa continued as though he had never brought necromancy up. You have your right to mourn. But what you've been doing... The way you've been acting, it's shameful. He paused as though he expected her to disagree with him again, but she didn't. She just stared into an empty shot glass. Not only is it shameful, he continued, it's dangerous for you. I know you think you can take care of yourself. Yeah, damn right I can. She pulled Randall's colts from the folds of her dress. Although she claimed to abhor magic, everyone in town was positive. She was just as guilty of using it as anyone else. Otherwise, how was she able to stash those six shooters without anyone ever being able to see them? It was as though she could just reach down and pull them out of empty air. She pointed them both directly at Pa's eyes, but he didn't flinch. The barrels weaved in the air, bobbing this way and that as she tried to steady her hands. Most of the time, they weren't even pointed at their intended targets. That didn't take anything away from the sudden intensity in the hushed room. Everyone there was positive that if she pulled the triggers, Pa would have two holes opening up in the back of his head. They also knew he would make her pay for it. Pa gently pushed the pistols aside, and Cassie led him. She set them down on the bar carefully, as though she were afraid they might break, but straining as though they were incredibly heavy. Pa started his sentence over again. I know you think you can take care of yourself, but the rest of us still worry about you. You've been reckless, and there's very much the possibility that someone could hurt you when you keep getting so damn drunk. Besides, that's no way for a lady to act. Cassie snorted, but said nothing. Cassie? Pa said. Let us help you. The only way you can help me is by finding the undead bastards that killed Randall so I can burn them all to hell. Other than that, you help by leaving me alone to drink. Pa stood up, drank his whiskey, and ran his hands over the front of his suit as though to brush it off. A small cloud of dirt billowed up from him, yet his suit didn't appear any cleaner. I was pretty sure you would say that, he said. I just wanted to give you a chance to do it the easy way. He walked to the front door, his boots clicking loudly against the floorboards. And it was only then that Cassie realized how quiet the saloon had become. She turned on her stool and looked at the other patrons. The bartender, 
the whores, and anyone who wasn't directly associated with the Carters had vacated the room at some point while she hadn't been paying attention. There were still some men at various tables around the room. Each one was standing. Each one was shaken with fear as he approached her, and each one was moving his lips quietly and muttering under his breath. Cassie may have made it a point to avoid magic in all its forms, but she certainly knew incantations being spoken when she saw them. Cassie spun around on her stool to grab the colt, but by the time she had them aimed at two of the cowboys' heads, she couldn't see straight, like she'd just polished off another six shots of whiskey in the last five seconds. By the time she collapsed to the floor, her sight had left her, but her sense of hearing stayed long enough for Pa to speak one last time. Please don't think this means I have any less respect for you, Cassie. Cassie woke up somewhere out on the plains. Her dress and undergarments gone, and her arms and legs tied to stakes driven into the dry ground. The moon showed full overhead. Always the full moon, she thought. Why does it seem like that's the only kind of moon we ever have in Ogre Ridge? You lily-livered sons of horses' asses, she said. She wasn't sure exactly who she was talking to, but there had to be someone. There was always someone around for things like this. She would have called them much worse, but her head still swam with either the magic she'd been hit with or the whiskey. Probably the magic. Only a tenderfoot had a hangover after only 15 shots of whiskey. A head came into her view. One she easily recognized. Until now, Wagon Wheel Carter had been one of the few among Randall's siblings that she'd been able to tolerate. He was the least obnoxious and full of himself, but he really didn't have any room to be. He'd gotten his nickname from the time when one of the Harrimans had tried to ride him down with a chuck wagon, and one of the wheels had crushed his foot. Most of the other Carters would have hunted the man down and shot him, or at the very least laid a curse upon his horse. Instead, a wagon wheel had cried and immediately retreated to the Carter Ranch and the care of his mother. Being a whiny mama's boy might not have endeared him to his brothers, but it made him tolerable to Cassie. If he had anything to do with this, though, she might just have to run a wagon over his other foot. That might even be doing him a favor. After all, his lip might not be as pronounced if it was in both legs. I'm going to untie you now, he said. There was a tremor in his voice. If you do anything stupid, it'll only take me longer. Where's my dress? She asked. I had to take it off, he said. Even in the night, it was easy to see his cheeks turn rosy. The the spell required you to be naked, but, but, but they gave us another dress to give to you now that we're finished. Wouldn't be very Christian of us to make you walk around naked now, would it? Uh, I have your guns, too, but I won't give them back t- until, uh... Cassie didn't actually hear most of what he said. What she had heard was that they'd taken away her dress and performed a spell on her. She couldn't decide which was worse, but that wasn't exactly the most important decision she had to make at the moment. It was much more important to figure out how many times she wanted to make Wagon Wheel scream before she put a bullet in him. Now wasn't the time for that, though. He began untying her right wrist, and it was only then that she heard other voices. She looked around and finally got a feel for her surroundings. She was in the center of a pentagram that had been drawn in the dirt along with a variety of vaguely familiar symbols. She didn't know enough about magic to know what any of them were supposed to mean, though. Four other men in Stetsons and Dusters stood around the pentagram, and in the instant her right arm was free, she used it to cover her breasts. Then she realized they could still see between her legs, and tried to cover that as well before simply giving up. There was no way she could keep her modesty using only one arm, and they had already seen her naked body for the entire length of the spell anyway, however long that had been. None of the men seemed comfortable looking at her anyway. She recognized them all as hired men for the Carter family who spent most of their wages in the brothel. So the only reason she could think of for their sudden shyness was her reputation with a six-shooter. Even despite her compromising position, the thought brought a smile to her face. It also made her think of something else and her head immediately went to her neck. Her tiny silver cross was still on its chain around her neck. 
at least there was that. They must not have felt comfortable removing her from God's presence or something. They didn't have any problems removing her clothes, though. Hypocritical bastards. Wagon Wheel still hadn't finished untying her left hand, but Cassie backhanded him anyway. Yeah. It felt mighty good. She went to work untying the rope herself as Wagon Wheel tried to stand up from where he had fallen in the dust. That wasn't necessary, he said. He looked like he was about to cry. What did you do to me? She asked, trying to put enough venom in her voice to cover any embarrassment that might leak out. Wagon Wheel watched her free her other hand and start working on her legs. His words came out in a quiet stutter. All I did was what Pa told me to do. I swear, it was just a spell for protection. It really was. As Cassie freed her first foot, Wagon Wheel moved behind one of the other men as though to shield himself from her. The man pushed him away with a disgusted noise. The alcohol had mostly worn off, so Cassie was able to take in all the information and compare it to what little she knew about magic. A protection spell, but it needed five casters? And it needed her to be naked? Didn't sound like a protection spell to her. More like a summoning spell. But she couldn't be sure. And what would they even want to summon? Something like that probably would have required the blood of a virgin, too. She paused and untied the last rope to check herself for cuts. Yep. Right there in her palm. A shallow slice that had only just started to scab over. Stung like a son of a bitch, too. With the last rope untied, Cassie stood up. The four hired hands paused, and each one put a hand to a six-shooter at his belt. What exactly did they think she was going to do? Attack them with her hair? Wagon Wheel cleared his throat, <clears throat> and Cassie turned to see him standing behind her with a folded-up dress, held out to her at arm's length. She snatched the dress out of his hands and talked as she covered herself. I want my wedding dress back. Wagon Wheel shook his head. Pa said I can't do that. She punched him in the gut. He doubled over, and there were four clicks from behind her as the others pulled their guns and prepared to fire. Cassie had no worry that they actually would, though. If Pa Carter had gone to all the trouble of setting this up, then she had to believe he really did have her best intentions in mind. Although, that didn't take away her desire to break a bottle of sarsaparilla over his head. No, she suspected heads would roll if anyone actually shot her. She looked around for her wedding dress, but she didn't see it. Just the men, the pentagram, and six horses some distance behind Wagon Wheel. Either the dress wasn't here, or they'd hidden it too well. It didn't appear that she would be getting it back any time tonight. Wagon Wheel's pain had subsided enough that he was able to stand upright again. I wish you'd stop that. Just give me my pistols and my shoes so I can be on my way. Wagon Wheel led her to the horses and pulled her remaining items from a saddlebag, while the other four went to work kicking dust over the pentagram and removing any sign of the ritual. Wagon Wheel watched as her pistol disappeared somewhere into the folds of her dress. Please, y you have to tell me how you do that, he said in a whisper. Do what? Cassie asked. She put on her shoes and then mounted the nearest horse. <laughs> now, now hold up a minute, Cassie, Wagon Wheel said. Just wait for the rest of us and we'll escort you back to the ranch. Do you really think I'm going anywhere near the ranch again after tonight? She asked. Wagon Wheel wasn't even able to follow the movement of her hand as it flashed down to her dress, pulled one of the colts from somewhere, and aimed it at him. The report <laughs> echoed out through the night, followed by Wagon Wheel's anguished screams. Again, all guns were aimed at Cassie, but she kept her own steady on Wagon Wheel as he hopped around with blood streaming from the hole in his foot. If I ever hear that you have breathed the word of this night to anyone, Cassie said, the next bullet will be in your good foot. She turned her horse so that it was facing the hired men. Same goes for all of you, except I'll be aiming for something a tad more vital than your feet. She turned her horse back towards town and started it at a good gallop. The four men kept their pistols aimed at her for a long time, yet no one fired. Cassie was feeling pretty sober by now, and there was nothing worse she could think of than being sober at a time like this. She didn't have her wedding dress, she didn't have a place to stay, 
but Wagon Wheel had at least left her with money enough to get good and drunk. The moon had begun to sink low in the sky by the time her horse was trotting down the main street in town, and she couldn't see any lights burning in any of the windows. That wasn't good. Ogre Ridge wasn't the sort of town that kept traditional hours. There may not have been many outsiders who came around and witnessed the town's peculiarities, but the townsfolk still tended to do most of their strangest business after sundown. People just felt more comfortable raiding graveyards and calling the fairy folk when it was less likely they would be seen. That was also when Sheriff Peckinpah got his fat ass to bed. He didn't want to deal with Ogre Ridge at night, and with no sheriff around, it was the perfect time to practice any sin or vice the inbred citizens could come up with. Yet, the night was completely peaceful. Cassie wasn't too sober to figure out that this was all wrong. It had already been late when Pa Carter's wizards had pulled their mojo on her, and she had no idea how long she'd been out. So it was entirely possible that the world wasn't too far from morning. Even then, however, there still should have been some activity. It shouldn't have been dead quiet. Cassie kept her ears open for anything other than wind-blowing tumbleweeds. Although, as she had witnessed once before, even those could be deadly dangerous if enchanted by a wizard with the right imagination. But there was nothing. She reined her horse into a stop right in front of the saloon, quietly cussing when she saw that it too was dark, and surveyed the street. Something had to be keeping people indoors and quiet. And it couldn't just be the threat of violence from someone. There were enough drunk, angry, and just plain mean fools around here that wouldn't be that easily scared. So it had to be something more. Maybe a sleeping spell. There were only two people she could think of with that sort of power. Pa Carter and the head of the damned Harriman clan, the Matron. She figured pretty quickly that it was safe to rule out Carter. Immediately. She drew out her colts. She dismounted her horse and tied it to the nearest hitching post, then went to stand in the middle of the street, quietly turning, and ready to point her pistols at the first sound of trouble. There was nothing. Just the night. Then there were spurs. Her hearing couldn't be said to be better than anyone else's. But in the quietest early hours of the morning, with only a small town around her, a sound could carry forever. It could have been coming from anywhere, from any distance. It was even possible that it might not have anything to do with her. But she could hear that sound so clearly, a jangle of loose metal on steadily stumping boots. She closed her eyes and concentrated completely on her sense of hearing, trying to hear any clue as to where it might be coming from. Still, the direction escaped her, but she could catch just a hint of something not quite synchronous in that jingle jangle jingle. More than one person was making that noise. There were three, each one stepping in time with the others in an attempt to mask their numbers. Cassie knew what that meant. Just as she had known on her wedding day, she hadn't believed that anything like this could be coming for him. Not on that day of all days, but she believed now and it made her heart race. In the months since that day, she'd tried so hard not to feel anything. But she definitely felt something inside herself now. She felt fear. The marauders were coming. She didn't actually see them until they came out from the alley between the general store and the sheriff's office. That was a damn bold thing to do, sleep and spell or not. The sheriff might have been a lazy bastard unwilling to lift a finger. But he didn't actually have to lift any fingers. He just had to set them on his precious red stone and concentrate real hard. And marauders were one of the few things Peckinpah actually made an effort to fight. He probably thought it was his special duty or something. After all, Ogre Ridge was likely the only town in the Colorado Territory that had seen fit to make a law against raising the dead as gunmen. So he might as well enforce it. Even before Cassie could make out their physical details, she could smell them. The wind wasn't even blowing from that direction, and they still offended her nostrils. They smelled a rotten meat that had been left to bake in the sun. 
They smelled of incense, something thick and cloying. But most of all, they smelled of the earth, of mud and worms and moss and deeply buried roots. The whole scent concoction made her stomach turn. The moon shone directly behind her and easily lit their features for her to see. They were old. Not that they had been old when they died, since not a one of them looked like he was over 25. But they'd been undead for quite a while. She'd even known this when she'd first seen them months earlier, because she'd remembered vaguely knowing them when they'd been alive. That was a rarity nowadays. People had become tired of the Carters and the Harrimans raiding the bodies of their loved ones from Boot Hill. So instead, the townsfolk had taken to burning their dead. Fresh corpses now had to be discreetly taken from neighboring towns. The fact that she'd known these three men when she'd been little didn't bother her, though. She hadn't liked them much then, so it didn't matter that she hated them now. The three marauders stepped out about a hundred paces in front of her. They were dressed in newer clothes, but already their coats had started to stain through from their rotting bodies. Each one had a six-shooter at his hip. The one standing in front of the others, Cassie thought maybe his name had been Joshua when he'd been alive, opened his mouth to speak, but was interrupted as a maggot fell out to squirm at his feet. Joshua grounded under his boot heel. I suppose it's too much to hope you're here for someone else, Cassie said. I suppose you're right, Joshua replied. Cassie bit her lower lip and tried to will her heart to slow down. It probably would have been smartest just to lay down her weapons, turn around or close her eyes, and let them shoot her. She had never seen a marauder go down. She'd even heard that a direct headshot might not work. Randall had gotten off enough shots before they'd killed him to take off one of their heads. The marauder had simply picked his head up and walked away with it. He was the one standing to Joshua's right now. A cowhand Cassie had known only as Little Buck. And Cassie could see the line of twisted scar tissue around his neck, where the head had been magically fused back on. Nothing short of incineration could destroy a marauder. And Cassie was sorely lacking in fire at the moment. The marauder's hands hovered over their firearms. Cassie straightened her arms and took aim at the two on either side of Joshua. Maybe if she were lucky, she could shoot off something they wouldn't be able to put back on. You could have just shot me down with Randall, she said. She was rather surprised when she couldn't get her voice to rise above a whisper. Joshua shook his head and smiled. But then again, his lips were so rotted away that it always looked like he was smiling. We only kill who we're ordered to kill. His voice was just loud enough that she didn't hear the faint creak of stone grinding against stone somewhere behind her. Cassie took a deep breath and felt the comfortable weight of Randall's cross on her chest. Now was as good a time as any to follow him to the other side. Cassie pulled her triggers at the same time all three of the marauders brought their pistols and fired. But all the bullets sparked and ricocheted into the night as they hit a wall of solid gray granite. Cassie saw the sparks fly first, before she heard the multiple gunshots, and then she realized she was also flying backwards through the air on a sudden gust of wind. Dust swirled in eddies, and the ground shook like a tiny earthquake as the giant gray, whatever it was, landed between her and the marauders. Cassie landed on her back next to her horse, and the wind was knocked from her lungs. She blacked out for a moment, then quickly rolled away as she saw her horse rear back, desperately trying to pull away from the hitching post and get away from the winged monster in front of him. The thing let out a roar that sounded suspiciously like a rock slide down a deep mountain face and lashed out at Joshua with a massive three-clawed hand. The stone fingers ripped easily through his gun arm and the severed limb went flying into the outer wall of the saloon. The other two went running back the way they had come, and Joshua paused for a moment to look at his arm like he wanted to make a dash for it before taking another look at the creature. He must not have thought it was something he wanted to risk, because instead, he turned and ran as fast as his crumbling legs would take him. Cassie, still panting from the near knockout, was already standing again and had her guns to bear on the creature before it turned to her. 
The thing had to be at least nine feet tall. Its eyes burned a fierce red, but that was the only evidence of color in its entire form. Its legs were half as short as its arms, and its chest was perhaps as wide as Cassie was tall. Such an ill-proportioned thing would have looked almost comical trying to walk around if it wasn't so intimidating. But it didn't look like it had to walk anywhere. Its wings, when fully stretched out, could probably block the whole of the street. A pair of finger-sized tusks protruded from its lower jaw, which by itself looked large enough to bite her in half. Cassie cocked her pistols, just waiting for it to rush her. But it didn't. Instead, it dropped to one knee and lowered its head, either in supplication or embarrassment. I am Stonehammer, the thing said, its voice like hundreds of pebbles being shaken around in a sack. And as much as it pains me, I am now your gargoyle. Cassie estimated there to be an hour before sunrise, which, by her best guess, would be about when the town-wide sleeping spell would wear off. Not only did that give Joshua and his cronies a chance to regroup and make another go at her, but even if it didn't, Cassie sure as hell didn't want anyone in town waking up to see a gargoyle following her around like a puppy. The only choice she could see was to get away from town for the moment and try to make sense of all this. It just would have been so much easier if she only had a bottle of whiskey with her. She urged her horse as fast as it would go out of town and towards the ogre, looking back over her shoulder every so often in hopes that she'd lost Stonehammer at some point. Most of the time he was there, it probably would have been a better pronoun since the space between his legs was smooth and devoid of sex, but she just couldn't bring herself not to think of him as male. Other times she wouldn't see him and would let out a premature whoop of triumph before looking higher in the sky and seeing his shadow blink out the stars. Cassie finally brought her horse to a halt at a stream near the base of the ogre. The largest portions of the Rocky Mountains were still many miles off, which was part of what made the ogre such a mystery. It was a geological oddity. A single mountain surrounded by miles of mostly flat plains and pine forest. Its strangeness was probably what had attracted the first settlers, but it was the discovery of copper inside it that had led to the building of Ogre Ridge. The copper mines had been all but forgotten by now, though, and the magic that had sprung up and changed the town was many times more powerful here. Few people knew how or why it was so potent on the slopes of the Ogre, although Cassie had always suspected Pa of knowing more specifics, but he didn't dare try to explore the mountain. None who had ever tried in the last nine years had ever returned. So the mountain just stood there, looming over the town, a monument to every secret Ogre Ridge wanted to keep, and every secret it could not know. It was risky to even come as close to the Ogre as Cassie was now, but it was one of the few places where she knew the marauders wouldn't follow. She hitched her horse to a stunted tree and approached Stonehammer. He landed soon after she'd come to a stop and nervously walked in circles like he too was uncomfortable being so close to the mountain. He'd already crushed all the vegetation around him. Once Cassie started towards him, he stopped and kneeled once more. Even with his pose of supplication, Cassie made sure to keep both her colts in hand and ready. For God's sake, stop that, Cassie said. She motioned for him to get up, and he went back to both feet. There was a light brown and red mess where his knee had been. He kneeled on a prairie dog, and it hadn't even had time to squeal in pain before becoming bloody pulp. As you wish, my master, Stonehammer said. It was hard to make out any sort of voice inflection when his vocal cords were made from solid stone, but Cassie could have almost sworn he sounded sarcastic. We need to talk, she said. And you're going to start by telling me why you won't stop following me. I followed you because I had no choice, he said. I have been summoned to be your guardian, and I must make sure you are protected for as long as I am awake. Summoned? Cassie shook her head and cussed under her breath. Damn it. 
This was wagon wheels doing. Pa had charged him with putting her under a protection spell. But could that inept little excuse for a wizard even cast one? Most likely not. So instead, he forced this thing on her. The next time she saw him, he was most definitely getting several bullets in his good foot. Well then, how do I get rid of you? She asked. The bond is not reversible. Stonehammer actually hung his head and stumbled over the words as though he didn't want to say them. Virgin blood was spilled during the ritual. If the blood had not been from a virgin, this would only be temporary. Instead, I have no other choice but to protect you until one of us is dead. Cassie looked at the cut on her hand and swore again. Damn it. Randall had tried to bed her once before their wedding day, but she had been adamant that she stay pure until it was right in the eyes of the Lord. She should have just told the Lord to go eat a horse nugget. Cassie was so preoccupied with her own thoughts that she almost missed Don Hammer's next comment. If you really wish that our bond be dissolved, though, you could always just shoot yourself in the head. Cassie jerked her gaze back to him with wide eyes. What? And if you do not want your body used as a marauder, I could always burn your stinking corpse if it pleased you. Excuse me? I'm not gonna shoot myself. If chunks of rocks could be said to frown, then that was what Stonehammer did now. Please, I know I must protect you, but that is only from outside forces. If you die by your own hand, then I have not technically failed in my duty. Cassie gaped. What the hell kind of guardian are you? Stonehammer stood straight, folded his arms in front of his chest, which wasn't easy for someone with arms as wide as tree stumps, and spread his wings to their full length. It took Cassie a moment to realize this was supposed to be a posture of pride. I'm a guardian who remembers a different world than this. In previous ages, I have been the bodyguard of kings, queens, and great heroes. I've seen great deeds, chivalry, and self-sacrifice. I've seen many reasons why your miserable race should not be wiped off this plane of existence. He folded his wings and leaned down to look her square in the eye. His breath smelled like sulfur. And yet I see none of these things now. I've been watching this plane from my own, and I've seen a great war fought over a human's right to enslave fellow humans. I've seen the native people of this land driven away or slaughtered, and I've seen you. I've watched you wallow in self-pity. Where others would seek justice, you have instead chosen to sit and do nothing. Stonehammer sniffed. And you smell of grain alcohol. When was the last time you washed yourself? Cassie almost made an attempt to shoot off his wings, then remembered it would simply be a waste of bullets. Do you think I want you here? If you really think you know so much about me, then do you actually believe I would have anything to do with magic? Stonehammer raised an eyebrow but said nothing. He even smiled a little. Cassie had a real desire to ask what he thought was so funny. And if you're really so all-knowing, Cassie said, then you know I have every right to be bitter. Or weren't you paying attention when that Harriman bitch had my fiancé killed? Stonehammer's smile disappeared as he shook his head. The one you call the matron may have been involved, but she was not the one most directly responsible. Cassie's brow furrowed. Then who was? Stonehammer shook his head again. Whoever it was used powerful misdirection spells. The person's identity was hidden from me. Cassie sighed and sat down on the nearest rock to take this all in. Joshua had said something earlier, something she would have forgotten if she and Stonehammer hadn't started talking about Randall's death. Something about only killing whom he'd been hired to. In the case of the Marauders, hired wasn't quite the right word. Once a necromancer raised a Marauder, it was bound to that necromancer, and only that necromancer. So... Whoever had ordered Joshua to murder Randall must have been the same one who wanted her dead. 
If it had been the matron who'd ordered the kills, it would be easy to say she wanted to take them out just because they were Carter's. But now that Cassie was sober enough to actually think about it, that didn't make too much sense. The matron may have been known for her vicious streak, but she also had a reputation for not doing anything she didn't think was absolutely necessary to ensure her dominance over Ogre Ridge. And Randall and Cassie hadn't wanted anything to do with magic, or the whole ridiculous feud. Perhaps Stonehammer was right. There might just be something going on here that no one else was seeing. Even so, Cassie still didn't want a multi-ton reject from a European cathedral following her around everywhere. Isn't there any way I can get you to just ignore your duty? Stonehammer sniffed. <clears throat> I would give my right tusk for that possibility. But that is not the way the spell works. Whenever I sense you are in even the slightest danger, I must fly to your aid. Stonehammer glanced up at the sky and smiled. Cassie looked too, but she couldn't see what he found so interesting. The sky was brightening as the sun rose to just below the horizon, but that was it. That is why I thank the gods of my ancestors for the sun. Cassie frowned. What do you mean? Stonehammer made a slight bow to her. His creaking sound of stone against stone was louder than before, and he appeared to have some difficulty moving. I bid you good day. It is my most sincere wish that while I slumber, you are torn limb from limb by something vile. His speech slowed to an almost unintelligible drawl. The first ray of the sun spilled over the horizon, and Stonehammer froze. His glowing eyes faded to a rough gray, and all the life was leached out of him. Cassie took a step forward and touched him, half expecting him to rebuke her or swat her hand away. But he did nothing of the kind. What had been a massive and fearsome beast only minutes before was now was just a crudely sculpted statue. Even his sulfur breath was gone. Cassie shook her head. She wasn't sure whether she should laugh or cuss, so she just did both. <laughs> <laughs> Only a harebrained like wagon wheel could bond her to a bodyguard that wasn't even alive during the day. It was a lucky break for her, at least. She hadn't looked forward to going back to town with a self-important lump of granite following her everywhere. She couldn't deny that he had saved her life, though. Or, at least she couldn't while sober. It was all the more reason to get back into town and start drinking as soon as possible. As anxious as Cassie was to find solace at the bottom of a bottle, it occurred to her on the ride back to town that she had other things she needed to take care of. First and foremost was sleep. Not counting the magical nap she'd been forced to take, she hadn't actually slept in almost 20 hours. And unless she wanted to crawl back to the Carter Ranch and say she'd been wrong, she was going to have to find someplace else to rest. That particular problem was easy to solve. There were multiple rooms above the saloon that the bartender had once rented out to anyone who might have passed through town. But ever since the change, the rooms had gone unused by all except for whores and their customers. The bartender was happy to once again be making steady money off one, but Cassie suspected his enthusiasm to help her had less to do with her money and more to do with the cult she spun on her finger while they'd been negotiating the price. Her clothes, however, were more problematic. The dress wagon wheel had given her was too small. But even if the idiot had gotten her size right, she still didn't think she would be comfortable in it. Now that she'd worn something fresh for the first time in months, Cassie wasn't sure she could bring herself to put on something as infused with stink as her wedding dress. But its absence still grated at her heart. Wearing some other dress just felt strange. She had to find something else, but once she had slept, she knew the perfect place to look. Sneaking up to the Carter Ranch was hardly an easy proposition, but she had a definite advantage over anyone else who might have tried the same thing. 
The ranch was just north of town in an area that had originally been thick with pines. But a large swatch of the pine forest had been cleared away and then used to build the main house itself. The house was a sprawling and luxurious building that Cassie was sure could rival anything in the so-called civilized cities out east, and the heavy scent of pine intoxicated the nostrils of anybody that came close. The Carter family and their associates, though, were the only ones who knew that. Everybody else ran afoul of the protection spells around the property and turned into frogs. There was an abnormally large population of frogs around the ranch. Cassie's heart sped up a little when she passed through the magic barrier. There was always the possibility that the spells had been adjusted since last night so that she was no longer welcome. But all she felt when she came onto the property was a tingle all over her skin. She was still allowed here, but someone within the Carter inner circle must not have been happy about it. It was as though someone had tried to tamper with the spell and failed. What worried Cassie more than the magic was the possibility of being seen. She'd been mostly liked around the ranch, although perhaps not as much after she'd crawled inside the bottle, and several of the hands were in the habit of exchanging words with her whenever they saw her, although she suspected that most of them were only trying to be nice in an attempt to get her into their bedrooms. Pleasant exchanges weren't something she welcomed today. There was always the possibility that if anyone found out what she was doing, she would never be allowed back. She wanted to stay welcome, even if it was for no other reason than that the Carters always kept extra bottles of whiskey around. Cassie's heart had just started to calm down from her scare with the barrier spell when it started to speed up again. There was definitely something wrong here. Although, at first, it was more of a gut feeling than something she could prove. Then, as she took up a position behind one of the last trees before the open space around the house, Cassie cocked an ear and tried to listen for anything out of the ordinary. The only noise she could hear was wind in the trees. There were no birds singing, no horses running in the corrals, not even any of the damn frogs. And now that she was paying attention... She noticed something else, too. She was tired. There was a slight exhaustion that had come over her, a gentle tugging at her eyelids and all her muscles that told her maybe she should sit down, maybe just hunker against a tree and take a nap. It wasn't an overwhelming feeling, but it was just enough to make her sluggish. Another sleeping spell. It had to be near the point of wearing off, or else it would have knocked her out as soon as she came onto the property. She was really beginning to hate these damn knockout spells. Cassie's suspicions were confirmed as she passed the corral. All the horses were lying on their sides, their ribs gently moving up and down as they slept. One of them kept fidgeting its ear in its sleep, as though dreaming of being bothered by flies. She'd seen people and animals hit with sleeping spells before, and they didn't make any movement whatsoever until there was an hour or so left in the spell. Some of the horses were sprawled in painful positions, as if they'd fallen asleep in the middle of trotting. Yet Cassie couldn't see any of the hands lying around. The spell had to have been cast while everyone was still asleep, and it was early afternoon now. Whoever had done this had probably finished what he or she needed to do hours ago, and just left the ranch to wake up in its own time. If there had been any danger for Cassie here, it was most likely long gone by now. Cassie pulled her pistols anyway, and double-checked to make sure she had loaded them. The danger may have been most likely gone, but this had required extremely powerful mojo. It shouldn't have been so easy to hit the Carter Ranch like this. The various magic barriers should have been able to keep all hostile forces out. Only the matron herself could have broken through. Unless, of course, you counted Pa Carter. Cassie swore under her breath at the idea. It was a horrible thought. Something she didn't even want to consider. Except now that it had entered her head, she couldn't get rid of it. That flying pile of rubble stone hammer had said someone other than the matron had been directly responsible for the attacks on her and Randall. And who else could so easily raise marauders, cast a sleeping spell like the one last night? 
and be able to get past the magic barriers to cast this spell from the inside. Cassie approached the house's front door. There was a flaw in her logic, she realized. Someone so strong with magic would have been able to kill her any time. So why now? Why at all? She stretched her brain trying to think of some grievance Pa might have against her. But she couldn't think of any. It was also very, very wrong and thinking too hard about it made her throat feel dry. Before she found out what was going on, before she took what she had come here for, she was going to have to find the liquor. Cassie had already finished off half a bottle of wild turkey by the time she started exploring the house, but it still wasn't enough to calm her nerves. It didn't help that her suspicions had proven correct so far. Everyone was still asleep in their bedclothes. She didn't linger for too long in anybody's room, but she did make a point to check Pa's bed. It was empty. Cassie paused for a moment outside the room that the Carters had been letting her use for the last several months, but didn't go in. She wanted to say that she had good memories from here that she wanted to dwell on, but in truth... She couldn't recall any memories at all other than where the room was. It had been offered to her immediately after Randall's murder, but she hadn't bothered to use it until she spent the first of many nights at the saloon. It made her a little sad now that she thought about it. The whole family had been over backwards to make sure she'd been taken care of, and yet she couldn't recall even so much as saying thank you. Wagon Wheel especially had gone out of his way for her and had always asked if there was anything she needed. Usually, what she needed most was someone just to walk her as far as her bed after heavy binges, which Wagon Wheel had been more than happy to do even though she was pretty sure she'd ended up puking on him several times. But just because she wished she'd been more appreciative didn't mean she'd changed her mind about stealing his clothes. An eye for an eye, after all. The door to Wagon Wheel's room was ajar, but that didn't strike her as unusual at first. In the back of her mind, a part of her was trying to speak up and point out that every other person's door had been closed. But she just wanted to get in, steal some shirts and pants, and maybe a hat or two, and then get out. It wasn't until she was about to push the door all the way open that she smelled the familiar odor on the air. Rotting meat, incense, earth. And with the smell, she heard Joshua's voice. That's when the gargoyle flew in from behind her. That damned thing ripped off my arm before we could run off. You idiots are lucky that's all it ripped off. I specifically told you to wait until morning. Wagon wheel's voice. Cassie's heart skipped a beat. You said her guardian wouldn't be a problem. Besides, your spell was working on everyone else like it was supposed to. And she looked spooked like she suspected something. I didn't see any choice but to go for her. It ain't my fault you didn't think the plan through. There was a gunshot, followed by a high-pitched wheeze as Joshua tried to scream through rotting lungs. Cassie jumped at the sound, then backed up around the nearest corner. Otherwise, at any moment, they could just walk out the door and see her standing there gaping. She was still close enough at her new vantage point to hear most of what they were saying. Don't you ever disrespect me again, Wagon Wheel said. I'm the one who raised you, and I can always turn you into dust if you mess up again. As it is, I already had to cast another sleeping spell when you showed up here. When my father wakes up, he'll know that something happened. It will only be a matter of time before he realizes who did it and how. Are you the one who wants to tell the matron that my cover is blown? Joshua mumbled something Cassie couldn't quite hear. Something like, no sir. And then added something else under his breath. There was another gunshot. Another wet scream. I told you not to disrespect me. Wagon wheel screamed. Now, if you don't want me to put any more holes in you, then you better get your ass back into town and kill the bitch before the sun goes down. What about Peckinpah and his damn deputy? Joshua asked. There was a nervous whine in his voice. Wagon Wheel sighed. It would be easier to take care of him if you hadn't come back here. I don't have enough energy to cast a full knockout spell. As soon as you find her, I'll just use something simple on him. 
But you have to be fast, understand? Joshua made a vaguely affirmative noise. Then there was a flurry of rustling noise as they walked to the door. Cassie pressed herself against the wall around the corner, put a hand on her cross, and silently prayed to whatever might be listening that they wouldn't come this way. They didn't. She waited to hear their footsteps go out the rear door before she raised her bottle to her lips and took a deep drink. At the same time the booze ran down her throat, she felt something wet run down her cheek. At some point during the conversation, she had, without realizing it, started crying. When Wagon Wheel and Joshua didn't return after several minutes, Cassie came away from her hiding place, went into Wagon Wheel's room, and tried to keep her mind off everything she'd just heard as she raided his clothing, but her thoughts strayed off him. She took a swig from her bottle every time some new unpleasant thought entered her head, but that only worked until the moment she put the bottle to her lips and found it empty. Cassie stared at the empty bottle for several minutes, wishing she really did know magic, just so she could make it full again. It remained empty. It felt a little bit like looking into a mirror. Shit, she said. The sudden sound in the quiet felt good to her ears, like she was able to make something around her go from horrible to normal. Shit! Shit! She let the last word become a scream, and on impulse she threw the bottle across the room. It exploded against the wall, sending tiny shards and neglected drops of liquor to shower over everything. It was Wagon Wheel. She had no choice but to confront it now. Wagon Wheel was the one trying to have her killed. At first she questioned how he could want her dead, and yet give her a guardian. But the answer came fairly easy. He wasn't the one who'd wanted her protected. His father had ordered him to perform the spell, and Wagon Wheel had to do it if he wanted to stay above suspicion. A spell like that had built-in witnesses, after all. So he had purposely bonded her to something that wouldn't always be able to protect her, so there would still be a way for Joshua and the others to get her. And if Wagon Wheel had been the one in charge of Joshua, then he was also the one who'd ordered Randall murdered. Wagon Wheel had wadded up her wedding dress and tossed it into a far corner of the room. Only God knew what he planned to do with it. She hadn't stopped weeping since she entered the room, but all her tears dried up when she saw the dress rumpled on the floor like that. Tears just weren't enough anymore. Tears didn't convey her horror at him treating her dress like meaningless rags. But even more so, tears weren't enough to show her disgust at herself. That dress had been so beautiful when the Carters had first had it made for her, and if she'd been marrying anyone else, the dress would not have looked anywhere near that stunning. They'd spared no expense for the finest fabrics and the best dressmaker, or at least the finest and best that could be found in the West. To Cassie, though, the dress had never been about the lacy and fancy styles. It had been a symbol to her of everything her life with Randall could be. And after he was gunned down right outside the church steps for all of Ogre Ridge to see, it had become a symbol of everything she couldn't have. The dress was a symbol of nothing now. She'd worn it out until it was nothing but dusty, filth-smelling rags. Stonehammer was right. She wallowed in her own misery for so long that she hadn't even realized when it was dried up and there was no more reason to wallow. Cassie picked up the dress and stared at it for a long time, not thinking about it, just staring. Then she dropped it and kicked it under Wagon Wheel's bed, where she probably wouldn't have to look at it ever again. She finished dressing, completing her new look with a long coat and a Stetson. His shirt was a little tight, but everything else fit about right. He certainly wasn't going to miss him, since Cassie had no intention of letting him live through the day. She couldn't quite bring herself to believe that he'd done all this, though. He would always seemed like too much of a screw-up to wield this sort of magical power. That was probably where the matron came in. She teaches him more advanced magic, and in return she ends up with her own mole in the Carters. That might explain how, but not why he'd want his own brother dead. 
Their father had always considered Wagon Wheel the biggest disappointment, even though Randall had been the one who'd shunned the family trade. So perhaps that was... An image came into Cassie's head of Wagon Wheel, covered in puke as he helped her into her room. That little son of a bitch. Everything made sense now, and she loathed herself for not seeing it sooner. He had been jealous of Randall, but that hadn't been about Daddy's love, or at least not that alone. He'd been jealous of her love, and when she hadn't come running into his arms after Randall's death, that had only made him angrier. All of this happened because Wagon Wheel had some stupid puppy crush on her. Cassie wiped away the last of the tears that hadn't dried on her face and hid her pistols in her coat. The matron still wasn't innocent in all this, and she planned to hunt her down and shoot her dead. But before she did that, she had to make Wagon Wheel twist and squirm in some truly horrific pain. She had the perfect plan to make it happen, too. Sunset was less than 15 minutes away, and Cassandra Grant did not appear to be anywhere in Ogre Ridge. Wagon Wheel had gone to the sheriff's office and chatted up Peckinpah for a while, waiting for the sound of gunfire as his cue to distract him. Joshua and his gang had gone right to the Thirsty Ox, positive that there would be a quick firefight and they would be gone before anyone had chance to raise an alarm. The people of Ogre Ridge must still have been feeling the effects of the sleeping spell the night before, because the saloon was only half as full as normal and no one seemed particularly quick on their feet. The bartender nervously stammered out that he'd rented out a room to Cassie earlier in the day, but hadn't seen her in hours. Nobody had, apparently. She might as well have erased herself from the earth. Wherever she was, their window to kill her without the gargoyle interfering was closing fast. Joshua twitched and fidgeted as he led the other two out into the street. After a few minutes, Wagon Wheel joined him, looking left and right down the street as though he expected Cassie to be standing there in full view with her pistols in the air while whistling the battle hymn of the Republic. Wagon Wheel wouldn't have put it past her. That bitch may have been a frigid drunk, but she had more cojones than most cowboys he knew. I didn't even have to distract the fat bastard, Wagon Wheel said. He actually fell asleep in mid-sentence. Wouldn't surprise me if a bullet flew right across his nose and he slept through it. It doesn't look like it will matter anyway, Little Buck said. Maybe she got wind of what was going on. All the more reason we have to take care of her now. I think maybe I've got a good cover story to tell my pa as far as the sleeping spell. But it won't do any good if she gets to him and says anything about what's been going on. Even if she hasn't figured it out by now, he'll put the pieces together. There were only a couple minutes left before the sun left the sky, and Wagon Wheel looked up and down the street one more time. In the western direction, the sun was mostly gone behind the rocky mountains in the ogre, and the sun glared on the water in the horse troughs. To the east, the moon was already starting to rise. It was useless. They had no choice but to abandon the search for the night. Wagon Wheel sighed, looked out at the moon, and let out a pleading cry. Damn it, Cassie, just come out and face your fate! He had no delusions that she was actually going to answer. That's why he was so surprised when she jumped up from behind a horse trough and started shooting. Cassie touched her cross as Wagon Wheel's plea echoed through the street. Dear Randall, she thought, please guide my hand. Then, without giving her fear any more time to set in, she leaped from behind the trough and into the street. She got off two shots before she tumbled and rolled in the dust. The marauders were already pulling their pistols, but Cassie had counted on that. She'd been carefully working the whole confrontation out in her head for the last couple of hours, and for the first time since her wedding day, she found herself wishing she hadn't had any alcohol that day. Her thinking had to be clear, and her movements had to be deliberate in a way they never had before. The first two bullets stayed true to their mark. The gun flew out of Little Buck's hand while the third marauder's hand actually exploded in green pussy flesh as the bullet passed through it. Joshua fumbled his weapon with his newly attached forearm. 
which was exactly as Cassie had hoped. She rolled back to her feet and fired two more bullets, only seconds after she'd fired the first. One bullet hit Joshua's hand and he too dropped his gun. But to a marauder, these sort of shots didn't mean much. Little Buck could still hold his weapon, and the other two simply had to rush her and rip her apart. These tactics would only slow them down, but that was all she actually needed. Wagon Wheel and the Marauders were too busy ducking and trying to pick up their weapons to notice that the other bullet hadn't gone anywhere near them. And if they hadn't been in such a panic, they might have realized that it wasn't intended to. Neither did they realize that it had gone right through the window of the sheriff's office. If her aim was true, the bullet had, in fact, gone right across his nose. Cassie only had time for a quick glance at the sheriff's office before she ducked back behind the trough. But she thought she saw the sheriff's plump face looking through the shattered window, his cheeks flush with anger. She didn't need to see anything more of him to know where he was going next. Straight to that special drawer in his desk and the shiny red stone he kept inside. It wouldn't take him any more than 30 seconds to say the proper incantations. That gave her a minute maybe a minute and a half at the most. She jumped out from behind the trough again, this time with a breeze flying past her cheek. Joshua had recovered his gun faster than she'd expected. Cassie took aim at his left eye, and half his head exploded. He issued a weird, echoey hollow scream as the bits of gore rained down around him. That would give her just the amount of time she needed, and it was the last completely necessary shot she needed to take. Wagon Wheel was trying to duck off to the side of the street, but his gimpy foot was slowing him down. As quick as she could fire, she unloaded what was left in her colts into his good leg. His scream was really quite exquisite. There was only a sliver of sun over the ogre behind the marauders, but none of them took note. All four of them might have been worse for wear, but they could still count. They knew damn well that Cassie was out of bullets. <laughs> you bitch! Wagon Wheels said. His voice sounded somewhat like the hiss of a snake. He crawled back towards Joshua, who despite barely being able to see, still held his pistol to bear on her. One pull of the trigger and she was dead. Cassie threw her empty colts to the ground and held her hands up where they could see him, as though to say, See? No more tricks. You got me. Something shot up into the sky from the ogre, and Cassie's heartbeat sped up. Peckinpah had been quicker with his summoning stone than she thought. The thing in the sky looked like little more than a red speck in the oncoming night, but it was still far away. Up close, she knew it would look huge. It didn't have to be like this, Cassie, Wagon Wheel said. The last side of the sun disappeared behind the mountains in another speck. This one gray left into the sky. The red thing was still much closer, though. Cassie could only assume that at some point she had made a miscalculation. Her plan had failed. She was going to die. Little Buck must have seen her eyes looking towards something behind them because he turned around and looked as well. Um, wh Wagon Wheel? Wagon Wheel ignored him. I, I tried to be there for you after Randall died, but you ignored me. And now you've gone and done this. He gestured down at his newly perforated leg. Cassie didn't even look at it. The gray thing was gaining on the red one, and they were just close enough for Cassie to make out a few details. Both had wings. The red thing had a long neck and tail. Cassie had never had the misfortune of seeing Peckinpah's deputy up close, but she knew anyway that this thing was it. Wagon wheel, Little Buck said again. What? Um... I think the sheriff woke up and called Lula Bell. Everyone turned to look. The gray thing could easily be recognized now as Stonehammer, and he was neck and neck with his flying competitor. But no one was looking at him. Instead, everyone stared at Lulu Bell with her serpentine neck, her ivory horns, and giant leathery wings. Cassie couldn't blame them for staring. After all, it was only in a place like Ogre Ridge where you could see a deputized dragon. It only took a matter of seconds to be over. Both Stonehammer and Lulu Bell swooped at him, and Cassie ducked and covered her head. 
In that moment, she was sure Stonehammer was too late. She could even feel the air around her grow hot. Then there was the thud of Stonehammer hitting the ground, and his great gray wings wrapped around them both to create a solid shell. A solid, fireproof shell. There was an ear-splitting noise somewhere between a roar and a scream, then the deafening crackle of flames. Even from behind Stonehammer's wings, Cassie still sweated from the heat. Underneath all of the noise, so faint that Cassie couldn't even be sure she really heard it, there was an oh-so-familiar scream. Later on, even when she was in deep moments of depression, Cassie only had to think back to that half-heard scream, and it would bring a smile to her face. In the days and years to come, many stories were told about what happened that evening. Most of them were not true. Many people would say that they had witnessed the entire gunfight, but the truth was that there were so many gunfights in Ogre Ridge that ended up on the business end of Lulu Bell's breath that no one had even bothered to look out their windows. There was one solitary person who ventured outside, however, a drunken ranch hand for the Harrimans, who had chosen the wrong moment and the wrong door in an attempt to find the outhouse. People kept buying him drinks for the rest of the night to keep him telling the tale. It wasn't the charred bodies on the blackened street that interested everyone, nor the brief glimpse he had of Lulu Bell as she veered back to her perch somewhere on the ogre. It was the moon. It had almost cleared the horizon by that point and as Cassie stood staring at the body, she was framed perfectly by the moon behind her. For the shortest of moments, the ranch hand was positive. He saw some sort of silhouette on the moon, something huge and muscular with massive wings, and then it was gone. The hand said it was as though Cassandra Grant had cast some sort of demon shadow on its face. On that night, and every night after that, Ogre Ridge knew her only as Moonlit Cassie. The sun would be rising again soon. Cassie had spent most of the night watching the bodies, which were no longer anything more than ash and bones, be removed from the street. The street itself was still black, but that was only dust. Eventually it would all blow away in the wind and there would be no physical evidence that this had ever happened. Some of the night was inevitably spent talking to Pa Carter. Cassie felt it was only right that she try explaining why she'd tricked his youngest son into being roasted alive. Much of her story he'd already come to suspect when he'd woken up that afternoon, but he'd appreciated the gesture nonetheless. He said again she was welcome to come back and live at the ranch, but Cassie had no urge to do that. She wanted to be on her own, she explained. She wanted to find her own path for herself. She'd been afraid at first that he might take that as some sort of betrayal on her part, but he didn't. They both knew that in her heart, she would always be a Carter. She only had eight shots of whiskey that night. Cassie had no desire to stay away from the bottle altogether, but still it might be best if she cut back. When the night was almost over, she went back to where she'd left Stonehammer the day before. He'd been waiting for her for some time from the look of it. The crushed prairie dog must have provided some mild amusement for him because he spent his time here tonight stepping on as many as he could. So much for remembering a more civilized time and all that crap. I did it, said Cassie as she approached him. I sought justice and I think I did a pretty good job at finding it. Are you proud of me now? Stonehammer sniffed and looked away. <laughs> I still find you to be a disgusting little being but perhaps I don't find you as disgusting as I did yesterday. Cassie smiled at him. I can live with that. But maybe you ought to start taking a better attitude with me. There's still the matron I need to take care of, so you'll have to help me on a whole lot of other occasions. Cassandra Grant, I will always hate you and every single bloated entrail inside your puny body. However, for better or worse, we are now partners. Stonehammer offered his hand to shake, and Cassie took it. Or rather, she took one of his fingers, since that was all she could wrap her hand around. 
If it's any consolation, I hate you too. Then, the sun broke over the horizon. Cassie left him there, mounted her horse, and rode into the sunrise. Author's Note Cast the Demon's Shadow was not originally intended to stand alone as a story, and it wouldn't exist at all without my best friend David Wright. When I first met David several years ago, we bonded over our mutual love of comic books, and as he was an artist and I was a writer, we decided to try making one ourselves. We wanted to do something different from the usual superhero stuff, and we started talking about mixing fantasy and horror elements with westerns. Before too long, we had created a world for our comic book, complete with a full cast of side characters. For various reasons, we have never actually been able to do the comic book, but when I saw an open call for submissions to an anthology dedicated to female protagonists, I immediately thought of Moonlit Cassie. With most of the elements David and I created, I can't remember whose ideas they originally were, but the idea of a female gunslinger was one I lobbied for from the beginning, and I had become disappointed that I wasn't able to use Cassie for anything. So I asked Dave if I could write Cassie's backstory where I would talk about how she first met her bodyguard Stonehammer. And since this wasn't something that would have actually been a part of the comic, he generously agreed. The final story came out too long for the anthology, however, and I started sending it elsewhere. I hope to someday write more stories in this world, but for now I'm satisfied with this one, as it is among my top favorite stories that I have written. Okay, welcome back. Good stuff, huh? Did you enjoy the story? Oh, I, I certainly did. I better have. How long did this sucker take us? <laughs> it's quite a large tale. Then we probably should keep this episode, or at least the, our conversation, short. Because now, this is our, this has to be our record. Longest story. It is. By far? Definitely. Yes, by far. I think the previous record holder was, was Rick Kennett's story, Time in a Rice Bowl. Yeah, that one, I think, was 8,000 words or a little above that. Yeah, this one was 12,000 words, so it is basically half again as long as our record was. So, do you remember the night that we recorded this? I don't remember the exact night, but I do remember how it went. Just say yes so I can continue. <laughs> yes. Well, well, normally when we get together, we shoot the breeze, we will check emails, we'll talk about stuff, we'll record voices for other shows, we'll re-record for things that didn't get caught up, we'll maybe do a, an episode. Yeah, we'll do some post-story chatter, we'll read a story, maybe even two. Yeah, if they're short, we can do two. Um, we argue, we go for a walk, sometimes we even get to watch something on the TV, but we knew that this one was going to be an all-night activity. And so we just sat down and, and we recorded. And how long did it go? It was almost three hours to record that story. And yeah, I can't imagine any recording session will be that long. Especially now since the computer crashes every 15 minutes. <laughs> Sometime I'll have to fix that. Now, hey, this isn't the first story Dr. Goodman has sent us. This is th number three, number four, number this five? This is his third story that uh, we've done with him, yeah. And uh, he was a little wary about the length, I remember. <laughs> so what he did was he sent a synopsis of the story mm -hmm. and then the first thousand words or so to whet your appetite. Ooh, that sounded like a whet word to me. All right. And uh, I'm assuming – how did he approach you about this story? Well, ever since we began, I've wanted to be open to the possibility of doing longer stories. I know a lot of other short story podcasts, they have like a hard set limit. You know, it's 6,000 words or less and nothing over that. A lot of stories that are longer are better because of it. You get more in that story. Your story is more meaty. So I didn't ever want to uh, preclude that possibility. So, I mean, we have that in our submission guidelines. If you want to send a, a longer story, a novella, of course, query first because... We're not just going to be like, yeah, sure, 12,000, I'll read this whole thing and see if I like it. You know, we want to see if it's something that's going to catch our interest to begin with. So if you say, I have a story, it's this long, 
it's about this, 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 and this, and here's the first couple segments of it. So we can read that and say, oh, that sounds interesting. Send us the rest of it, and we'll see uh, from there. And that's what we did with his story. He sent us the first bit, and I thought it was cool, so I said, send, send more. And I enjoyed it just as much, and after kicking you and jabbing you with sharp objects, and I think I printed it out and gave it to you, and it was something like 40 pages long, <laughs> printed out. <laughs> I finally got you to read it all, and you were all for it, too. So, yeah, we went for it. You know, I, I might have been a little predisposed to accepting this story anyway. I really enjoy the subject matter, and... You know, that that actually reminds me of... It's time for the comments from Rish Outfield. Listener discretion is advised. You know how when you reach a certain age... Okay, when when I reached a certain age, <laughs> and <laughs> I found most others... Most of us haven't reached that age yet. I mean, not unless you're listening to this through a hearing aid. But uh, most of the time, when somebody becomes a teenager, they tend to rebel against the things that remind them of their parents, against their parents themselves. Uh-huh. And my dad is just a giant fan of the Western genre. He loves Westerns. He loves John Wayne. He loves all the trappings of the Western, the old Western TV shows, and the, the myth of the Wild West. And, I mean, he would listen to Gene Autry and, and uh, Sons of the Pioneers and Roy Rogers and these, these archaic, <laughs> sappy campfire songs from my grandparents' day. Okay, so when I reached that age where I started to hate my dad, I so hated Westerns and that kind of music and that kind of idea and the chaps and the guns and the hat. Ugh. Except for the assless chaps. You did have the pair of those still, right? Yes, but they were leather and I, 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 I thought of the village people. <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't fringed, so it was okay. But as seems to happen with pretty much everybody, they grow out of that rebellious age. But yeah, I'm not going to speak for everybody. For me, once I reached a certain age, suddenly that stuff started to seem nostalgic to me. That stuff started to seem familiar in a in a comforting, looking back on home sort of way. And I started to seek out Westerns and seek out these movies that I never would have watched because they reminded me of my dad. And when Dances with Wolves came out, that just grabbed hold of me and I, you know, I, it's something that my dad and I had in common. I'm sure he didn't think it was a real Western or any good or whatever. But suddenly the, the, the gulf was a little smaller between us. And, and he'll always talk about, oh, have you seen Sons of Katie Elder? And I'm like, well, no, you know, and then I check it out and I'll be like, hey, dad, I saw this. And they remade it as four brothers and it had Marky Mark in it. Smack. <laughs> Get out of my house, queer. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny because I, I will seek out these Westerns and then he and I will be able to talk about them because I inherited his memory for movies. And he's like, oh, yeah, I remember that movie and that had so and so in it, even if I'd never seen it. And he was like that, too. And, you know, I was telling him about uh, seeing a Creature from the Black Lagoon in 3D. And he's like, I saw that. Julia Adams was in that. I was like, you saw Creature from the Black Lagoon, Dad? You know, kind of thing. And you remember the girl? And he's like, oh, nobody forgot that girl. And I was like, what? <laughs> it was weird because I had the exact same feeling 40 years later. You know, he did. So I guess to, this is a long story. I apologize. But I leapt on this. The chance to do a Western uh -huh. and a... A horror western, a supernatural yeah. western, that's what it is, supernatural western, with all sorts of cool undead gunslingers and Some wizards and magic spells. Gargoyles. You, you, know, you, you must have a soft spot for gargoyles now that you mention it, <laughs> because this is our second story with gargoyles. I think this and, is more than our second story with gargoyles. We Well, no, okay. There was... Finding Nemo. <laughs> What's it called? Finding it Archie. Called raising Archie. We're raising Archie, and... This, and gargoyles? This there was the mention. I, they weren't actually real, or maybe they were. But in uh, On the Origin of Sounds, there was the gargoyle mechanics as well. You can't forget them. Wow, I, I had forgotten them. <laughs> there may be actually other gargoyles somewhere of gargoyles being Rampian in, in the, the story. Tower. <laughs> I don't think it was Rampion, but it was something more, a little more recent. And they just may be still to come, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Well, but, do you have a particular love or fetish for gargoyles? 
I don't, you know, I don't know really anything about gargoyles. There was that cartoon. Did you ever hear about that cartoon, the gargoyle cartoon? Yeah, Jonathan Frakes and uh, Marina Sirtis did voices on it, I remember, yeah, but I, I never saw it. I never watched it either. I mean, I saw like a minute of it here or there or something sometimes, but it never interested me. I thought the gargoyles on the Hunchback of Notre Dame weren't bad, but even then they were kind of dumb. Now, they were the comic relief in that yeah. movie. Because I remember people saying, wow, this movie is so adult. Except for the comic relief gargoyles. I wonder what that movie would have been like without them. Better or worse? I don't know. It, well, for me, it was all the serious stuff. The Quasimodo stuff that I really responded to right. in that movie. But I suppose they feel obligated to put in kid-friendly stuff. Because it's an animated film. Yeah, it is supposed to be a kid's movie in the end. Although they really overdid it to try and make that one a kid's movie. But anyways, you know, when it comes down to it, I hardly ever even heard of gargoyles being characters or being, you know, used as real in anything. Till I read Raising Archie. And, you know, that was a great story. And it's just, for some reason, it's like the the whole vampire craze that we were discussing earlier today. Since Twilight came out, all of a sudden there's vampire uh, books and TV shows and etc. everywhere. And uh, yeah, I guess gargoyles are next. It's going to be, I'm in love with a gargoyle. And he's stone most of the time, but not in the good way. I enjoy westerns too, but I'm not. My, my dad wasn't that into them, so I don't have that. Uh, Your dad was more into show tunes. <laughs> maybe. I, I still like them. I, I, I've seen a few, but I've seen so very few when it comes down to it. What would you say your favorite Western is? Well, I, I already mentioned it. Dances of Wolves was easily my favorite Western. Yeah. I, I love that movie. And uh, I mean, it just moved me and inspired me. And it just, wow, it was. It's not a real Western. Try again. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> I like The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. That's one that I've wanted to see but actually never have. You know what I think my favorite Western is is High Noon. Oh! I really enjoyed that one. That one's pretty darn good. And I even like that song. Warning, today's episode contains singing. Oh, don't forsake me, oh my darling. <laughs> I really like... He rode a placing saddle, he wore a shining star, his... D Warning. Singing. No, no, any idea? Now, is that blazing saddles you're singing there? Is it that is. something well, legitimate? You sang, hey, blazing saddles is a good movie. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't abide any Mel Brooks movies. I just have come to really despise that guy. His stuff is just so unfunny. You're basing this, of course, on Robin Hood Men in Tights, which is kryptonite to all humor. <laughs> uh, actually, that and even worse, I saw Dracula Dead and Loving It in the theater. And boy, did I want my money back after that one. Why can't you just get your money back from a theater if you go to see a movie and it really, really sucks? Can you just do that? You can can you just go and complain and say, listen, this movie sucked. I want my money back. Will they give it to you? Have you ever tried that? I've gotten my money back on a couple of movies, but it's half because the movie was offensive to gay people <laughs> and the other half because there was some kind of uh, technical problem or... Yeah, technical problems. Uh, I've heard of that and you, your story about your friend who would say that any movie was offensive to gay people just to get a free movie. Now, should I mention that on the air so I explain that? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay. I had a friend in LA named Mick and he had this foolproof way of never having to pay for a movie. And it was, at some point, he would get up and go and walk out. And it could be, while the credits were rolling, the end credits, uh, he would get up and he'd go and he'd say, I need to talk to the manager. And he would say word for word every time, this movie is offensive to gay people. It would be so funny because after two or three <laughs> movies, I would see him do it. We'd say, oh, there goes Mick. He's going to go ask for his money back. And he would get it. And he would say, okay, who wants their money back too? <laughs> <laughs> and he would just point to one of us. And he's like, you know, my friend and I found this movie offensive to gay people. And then you point to me or point to somebody and said, voila, we get a free pass. Now, they don't give you your money back, I don't know. Oh, they give you a free pass they for a later movie? They give you a free movie. pass for well, another movie. Which, of course, he's going to trade in for another free pass and another free pass. <laughs> and and give, give me the name of some of the movies you got a free pass from. Because well, I want an only, example of just how non-offensive to gay people these movies probably the are. The only one I can think of is that Cats vs. Dogs movie. <laughs> because I mentioned that to you when we were doing that Cats vs. Dogs episode. And now... Now, sometimes you and I will go to the movies and you'll elbow me and say, this movie's offensive to gay people. 
he and I went and saw Reign of Fire. Okay. Which was the Christian Bale dragon, dragon fighting Futurism movie. Futurism And movie. yeah, it was offensive to gay people. <laughs> the funny thing is the managers are too afraid to be offensive to gay people themselves and say, get out of here. <laughs> What's offensive to gay people in this movie? You tell me what it was. I'd like to see him just ask one time, what, what was it that was offensive? I'm sorry. What was it? Just so that he goes, uh, uh, it was that, uh. Those were good times. And yeah, he, he was one of those guys. And you know, I don't know that there's a lot of them out there. <laughs> I'm not talking about gay people. He was one of those guys who would have fun just going to the movies. If it was a bad movie, he would have fun making fun of it afterwards. If it was a good movie, he'd be like, oh, that and and if it was mediocre, he would have fun talking about what worked and what didn't work. Uh -huh. and, and I'm like that too. I mean, unless a movie is just an abomination, I almost never regret going to see a movie. Uh-huh. I do regret going to see 2007 Transformers, as I've mentioned on the show. But there's a lot of movies, maybe even worse than Transformers, that I don't regret going to. Because we had a big laugh quoting it afterward or referencing or saying, oh, you know what? I saw with her, you know, and didn't get any afterwards. Have you ever walked out of a movie because it was so awful you just couldn't take it anymore? No, I haven't. I don't think I've ever done that myself. But there were two movies that I wanted to walk out on. One of them, I was there with a big group, so there was nothing I could do. Uh -huh. And I was just in hell. <laughs> and then another time, it was a test screening. And the whole purpose of a test screening is to show it to people and then talk to them afterward or get their notes so you can find out what's wrong with it, how to fix it and things like that. And that's what I kept saying to myself. I mean, it was a turd, but... <laughs> you can look, tell them what's wrong with it, and maybe it won't be quite such a turd when they actually release it. Right, and knowing that somebody somewhere is going to read your comments and weigh them against the comments of the other people in the audience, it feels empowering. It feels like I'm part of the filmmaking process, or, I'm, or it feels like I have a voice. I uh -huh. have a vote kind of thing. You know what right, I'm saying? yeah. And so I saw a bunch of really bad movies as a test audience, and it rarely felt like a giant waste of my time. A, because you get in for free, and two, because you have some kind of input. There were a couple of movies that I went to test screenings of where I saw a different ending than you guys saw. You know what I mean? <laughs> Because the audience reaction was so negative, they went they back went and back shot and something shot new. something else. And, you know, every once in a while, you go see something. And because the audience reaction is so bad, the movie doesn't get released. It's just shelved. It's written off. Huh. So this story is a little different from a Western. Like you said before, it's a supernatural Western or a... Not a sci-fi western, which we, you know, there's a very well-known sci-fi western that we're Not big fans Not well of. enough, no. Yeah, that's true. But this one's like a fantasy western. It's got witchcraft. It's, it's a Harry Potter meets the west or something like that. I mean, they're putting together a pentacle to summon a guardian for moonlit Cassie, etc., etc. All these sleeping spells and undead gunslingers and all these kind of things are involved in this. I personally, and, and we all know that I and per, probably you too are not really the most well-read folks. You've seen a lot of movies, but we haven't read a lot of books necessarily, which makes us probably unfit to be editors, but so what? I've never seen anything like this um, have you seen something that's kind of along these lines where it's Western crossed with fantasy elements? Not like this, but one of my favorite book series and yours as well is the Dark Tower series by oh, Stephen okay. King. Yeah, that's a good and that's so totally a fantasy Western with sci-fi elements, yeah. but, but it's much more fantasy and Western. And I, you know, later robots show up and things like that. Uh -huh. But I remember reading that the first time and having no idea – I don't think it gives away at the very beginning that this is the future. And then later in books, I guess it's not even Earth, right? Right. It's just, or, or is it not even Earth from the get-go? I, I don't – it's kind of a little of everything. I mean people from Earth go there and then there's various Earths on different dimensions and different things have happened in these different Earths and so on and so forth. So, But it, it sort of starts out as a typical Western. It's like the DC multiverse. Oh. There's Earth Prime and Earth One and etc. There's only one Earth and it's just 616. Yes! 
But uh, that book just starts out sort of as a typical Western with uh-huh. the man in black fled across the desert. And, the no, gunslinger and the fell gunslinger followed. followed. Good job. And it's not until they get to the town and the piano player is playing Hey, hey Jude, Jude that you go, wait a second, what? <laughs> and you realize that this isn't a normal Western or yeah. that there is something futuristic about this kind of thing. And, and to me, that just grabbed my imagination and, and that will probably be my benchmark for this sort of thing. Uh-huh. Do you think that uh, that whole Hey Jude Jude thing is what inspired the uh, creators of Battlestar Galactica to throw in all along the watchtower and just say, oh, it's just a racial memory. It's a song that always comes up. No, I think weed inspired that. <laughs> all right. I, I, you know, I've always really liked the mixing of genres. And of course, it goes back to movies for me because that's my forte. Uh-huh. Is that a word? It is. Did I use it correctly? Hell no, Rich Avil. Oh, thank you, mildly (laughs) offensive guest star, for showing up. But as far as movies go, it was kind of a fad, a very small fad, just like dueling volcanoes or dueling asteroids, (laughs) dueling body switch movies, to do a remake of a foreign film and set it in the Old West, like Yojimbo or Seven Samurai. The Magnificent Seven. Where's the Seven Samurai? Yojimbo's Fistful of Dollars, right? Right, good job. And then later in the 70s, Outland was made, which is a remake of High Noon, set oh, in space. Okay. Ah. Battle Beyond the Stars, Magnificent Seven, set in space. Oh, yeah. Bugs Life, Seven Samurai, set in Ant Colony. Take that. Zing! <laughs> oh, well, that deflated my argument. Oh, sorry. But I, I liked the idea of them doing a Western in space. Uh-huh. And, and there have been others beyond those. Those are the ones that just come to mind. And then, of course... Firefly is so, I mean, it's like 50-50, right? Yeah, it's basically a Western. People are it's even ha- wearing bonnets again and that kind of stuff. And, and and Serenity, the movie, is far more sci-fi than it is Western. And I yeah. think that that was studio pressure. But Firefly is just right down the middle, half sci-fi, half Western. And because I like both of those genres. Uh-huh. It's a great and, and because it's such a dang good show, <laughs> I just love it. And, you know, if we go two or three episodes without mentioning Firefly, <laughs> you guys got to flag us on it because, well, somebody's got to keep this mythology alive, man. And it sure as hell ain't Joss Whedon. No, it's not his <laughs> fault. I'm sorry. Joss Whedon is my master now, guys. Thank you. I, I guess that's a contribution. He, yeah, he's, he's earning his paycheck. You know you like it. I it, and I dig this universe that he created, and yeah, I would really happily interesting. do a sequel or prequel to this story. Yeah, um, it's something that you and I talked about when we did the reading. Is the matron never shows up? Right. What is the matron like? Who is the matron? Well, who does her voice? What are her abilities? You know, and and things like that. So so there is. Does room. she have a dusty jacket too, like Paul Carter? Um, I grew up on a farm, so I'm much more partial to this kind of thing. Anyway, I don't know. You know, we had a horse, we had cows, we had chickens. Uh huh. You know, some of my friends, you know, might have been more into westerns, and I remember playing cowboys and Indians before it became buggers and astronauts. <laughs> And when Unforgiven, when Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven came out in 92, my guess I is. I think so, yeah. We all decided that we were going to go to the premiere of this dressed as cowboys. Oh. And so I had to go over to my grandma's house <laughs> and find like a, a hat and a western shirt and a jacket. Because I didn't have any of this stuff. This was during my, you know. I, uh, that was when you my, had your face uh, whitened and your hair all blacked out and you were all dressed up like the cure. Will you never? Rest, fight the battle of who can Can't care less. less. Unearned unhappiness. unhappiness. You're my hero, I confess. That's lovely. Warning. Singing. We need hey, to, you've already said that. We need to kill the singing out of the episode before he gets there. No. You know, I was never cool enough to get a job at a record store. And if I had, you wouldn't want me anymore. Now, that's also a song quote. I'm sorry. I was never cool enough to be a goth. To go up there and wear the eyeshadow and all that stuff. I didn't have enough confidence in myself. Uh-huh. I got beat up enough in high school. <laughs> but if we could go back in time, you would have been kicking the crap out of me. You probably would have anyway. But yeah, I would have been so up and loud and the leader of the people that bitch and moan about everything instead of just the secretary of that team, of that intramural club. 
so no, no, I, I was never a goth. Um, but, <laughs> but you were also be. not a cowboy. No, and I owned nothing even similar to that kind of cowboy stuff. But my grandpa, of course, was a cow, a literal cowboy. He played for Dallas in 1964, wasn't it? No, but he nailed one of the Dallas Cowboy oh, cheerleaders good, good. in 1976. And that was when they were... <sighs> And so, yeah, I put on his hat and a button-up Western shirt, and I think he had some kind of jacket. That you have went, a duster? A he big didn't one? have a duster because, oh, oh, I'd be wearing that today. Cool. I want a duster someday. I think that'd be neat. And a hat. Big, should I wear a white hat or a black hat, though? Well, you are kind of a Buford Tannen, so I would say black hat, yeah. <laughs> um, Those are all the cool guys in country music these days, you know. Got to wear a black hat if you want to be cool. What's his name? Tim McGraw wears a black hat, I think. Wow, you're alienating everybody except you <laughs> right now. I'm the most alienated. That's the thing. I can't stand country wait, music. Wait, let's take the curse off it. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. <laughs> okay. Oh, but she's ruined country music. She made it all poppy and for little girls. That's crazy. You know, you hear these people complain about Taylor Swift contaminating country music <laughs> with her poppiness. But I mean, these same country legends that complain about Taylor Swift probably were complaining when Kenny Rogers had a crossover hit with Lady. Lady. Oh, so many years I thought I'll never find you. Warning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. We're going to have to uh, just put the disclaimer at the very beginning of yeah. the episode to keep people from listening at all. But so we all got dressed up, and you know what? I think we even had like my dad's cap guns from the fifties and stuff. <laughs> and I, yeah, I remember that was a big thing in my grandma's house. Is there were all sorts of guns, and uh, you're lucky you did that in 1992 because if you showed up at a movie theater with cap guns on your belt, fucking <laughs> police would be ramming your face into the tile. <laughs> uh, omit this mildly racist thing I'm about to say. Thank you. And that's another one of those things that's similar to the whole dressing up like the cure thing is that by the time Unforgiven came out, I was old enough that I didn't care if somebody's like, hey, you fucking cowboy, you know, or, or whatever it was. It was just it was dress up. It was fun to do that. And, and I remember you used to always want to take your son out dressed as Jedi to go to one of these god awful Star Wars. Yep. But you never did. Why? Well, we were going to do it for the last Starfighter. No. Airbender. <laughs> we were going to do it for the last Star Wars prequel that came out, but unfortunately we didn't get our costumes made in time. We went as Jedi for Halloween that year. You know, I, I thought that you had told me that you didn't end up dressing up because you didn't want to look like one of those jagoffs no actually i've i i've kind of become one of those jagoffs or i've just given up on that whole hatred you know there's so many people that and we've complained a little bit i think even on the show like how people just love to hate on whatever it is so as soon as a story for example comes out on some podcast here or there or wherever there's that person that jumps right in and says oh, i couldn't stand this story i didn't even make it to the end of it one of the main things that people love to hate on are Star Trek fans or Star Wars fans now who have probably superseded Star Trek fans because they rose so much to the forefront when those uh, prequels came out. And we've talked about this before. I don't hate that kind of stuff anymore, you know? I used to think, oh, what a bunch of dorks, a bunch of nerds. But these days I'm just like, you know, I bet those guys are having a lot of fun. I do things that other people would think is stupid because it's fun. Who am I to say what you can do for fun and what you can't do for fun? I'm all for it. Whatever it is that you enjoy, if you want to dress up like a cowboy to go watch Unforgiven, then do it. Even if you're the only ones, you know, which is probably going to be the case, especially oh, definitely we were the if only you're ones. watching it around here. It's not like you're going to an actual premiere or where the people were camped out. Well, hey, a couple weeks ago, Twilight opened. Uh-huh. And how many people were out yeah. there? Yeah. Dressed in their glowy gay Jacob. vampire stuff. Oh, that movie's defensive to gay vampires. <laughs> no, how many people were out there with their lame pseudo vampire outfits or lame pseudo werewolf outfits? And I can make fun of them. But again, I'll, I make fun of them for the movie they went and saw, not for dressing <laughs> up. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's cool. I, I, You know, if that's what is fun for them, then do it. You know, whatever you're into. I remember, I want to say it was for X-Men 3. There was a bunch of dudes that were just dressed up as various mutants. They all had, like, picked a different character. And there was a group of probably, like, ten kids. 
and like one of them had you know his hair poofed up and claws on his hand and the other one uh had like the helmet on to look like magneto and somebody looked like Iceman. Do you know what mutant I was dressed as? I was dressed as that one kid in New Jersey who was born with his digestive system on the outside. <laughs> Sweet. Whatever uh, floats your boat, then, you know, as, well, just, just if you're ones. not hurting other people, then, you know, do what you want. If what makes you happy, do it. And don't worry about the people that want to make you feel bad. Because, you know what, it doesn't matter what you do. There's somebody that wants to make you feel bad. You're here, sir. Be yourself. Yee. I'm the dream maker. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to know as far as this whole episode goes, this is our first what did we say? It was a novelette? Or did we say it was a novella? I think it's a novelette, right? Now, tell me, what's the difference between a novelette, a novella, and a... There's another one, a funny word. A I don't know what the next... I, I, I don't... <laughs> Novelinha. It's the Brazilian uh, Is that how you'd say it? In Brazilian? <laughs> I, I, it's just word count. I think it has to do with length. It's a rather personal question, sir. <laughs> how long is it? It, apparently 7,500 words. I, I think this is like going by the uh, Nebula Awards. Uh, they set up like their categories. You know, you can win in as a short story or as a no novelette or uh, as a novella. I think you need to rephrase. Don't say you can win. Oh, Say yeah. one can win. <laughs> that you, is probably you gotta uh, forget, lies. You forgot who you were talking to. <laughs> one might win it under the category of short story. Okay, so define short story. A short story is 7,500 words or less. Novelette is between 7,500 words and 17,499, basically 17,5. 7, 5 to 17,5 huh. is your novelette. And then from 17,5 to 40,000 words is a novella. And then after that, of course, it's a novel. I'm sure there was a point to it. <laughs> there was a point to this, yeah. I was just thinking, this is our first time doing a story this long. And we decided that we would do it as one large episode. And I'm curious what the folks out there think. I mean, what our listener out there thinks. Do you like the fact that we did it as one large episode? Or would you prefer us breaking it up and serializing the story so that it's not overpowering? You're able to come back week to week. Find the further adventures of Moonlit Cassie and Stonehammer. It could be like those Commander Cody serials where you get the further adventures. Although it's obviously it comes to an end because it's just a novelette. It's not an endless serial. But I like this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if you have an opinion one way or another on this, then swing on by the comments and say, you know, I prefer my long stories to be serialized or I prefer them to be one huge file because we do have another novelette that's coming up and it's even longer than this one. So I'm just curious what people think is better. Well, now, if people would like us to split it up, does that mean we need to do recaps at the beginning and said, when last we saw our intrepid <laughs> band? We probably should. Dale Arden's dress was even sheerer than before. Yeah, we probably should. Well, no, no, this is a question. If we break it up, does people want us just to continue where we left off? Or do we need a primer to tell us what's been going on? If you want to respond to that as well, most people ignore what uh, Rish has to say. But if you feel it's worth a response, swing by the comments. Hey, and you know what, folks? If you don't comment, I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. He's going to do that anyway. Oh, hey, uh, one other thing. Um, we have a promo to play. Oh, good, good. I've been holding it in the whole time. I, I'll be right back. Okay. Oh, yeah, you, you might want to stick around for this Pain one, dude. Time. What, you, wait, why? you might want to stick around, really. Wait, uh, wait, why? Well, this is this promo actually involves Mr. Rish Outfield. How about that? Really? Yeah. You've piqued my <laughs> curiosity. Yeah, there's. Uh, it's a promo for a story called Cowrie Catchers, uh, which is a what a podcasted novel or whatever. Abby Hilton, who is a friend of the show, your friend and mine, um, is the writer of this book. And she has put together a podcast, a full cast audio drama of this story. And part of the cast, it so happens, is 
you and I. She uh, decided to have us do a uh, voice on a couple of those. So yeah, this you remember doing that many months ago. She was, she must have been slumming. She couldn't get Norm Sherman or Kim the comic book goddess. To no, know, she she could get those. She made them the uh, important characters and cast you and me as the others. Oh, okay. Well, there there's some hope for this thing then. <laughs> That's right. So anyways, uh, we've got the promo for that, and you can go check it out over at her site. Play that, O eight O T, would you? Among the querulous island kingdoms of Wefravain, the only unifying power is religion, a wyvern cult ruled by an eccentric high priestess. My name is Morcella. You have permission to use it. The system is under attack by a gang of pirates called the Guild of the Cowrie Catchers, who prey on temple treasure ships. Skytown is just an idea, Captain. If that's true, then it's an idea you fought hard and lost. The temple police charged with eradicating this menace keep disappearing. Enter Gerard. Gerard Holivar. Your Highness. A young prince, exiled from his small island kingdom for rashly marrying the court minstrel. My captain of police has been missing for a red month. It is time to consider him dead, and I have decided that you will replace him. Gerard is smart, honorable, and a little naive. To break the pirate ring, he must cooperate with a wily, amoral colleague who has already tried to kill him twice. Everyone's wrong. Everyone cheats. Everyone will sell you for the right price. There are no real choices. That's the world, according to Silvio Lemire. As Gerard struggles to protect his talented wife, You are good. Good things cannot be evil. Obey his seductive employer, I'm sorry to have startled you, Captain. No, you're not. You're enjoying it. And forge a complicated friendship with his dangerous co-worker. I'm not your friend, Holivar. I have given you my one and only piece of good advice. Go home. He becomes increasingly aware that the pirates have a legitimate quarrel with the wyverns. Dark secrets lurk in the temple dungeons, and solving them will cost Gerard far more than his honor. The Guild of the Cowrie Catchers is an illustrated podcast featuring voices from around the potosphere. Learn more and view illustrations at cowriecatchers.com. That's cowrie like the seashell, C-O-W-R-Y, catchers like catch me if you can, dot com. I'm the author, Abigail Hilton, and you may have listened to my first series, The Prophet of Panamandora. Cowrie Catchers is a darker, grittier story. Subscribe and experience a Panamandora you've never heard before. The Grishnards think they are the dominant species on Wefravain. They are wrong. One need only look in the temple on every island to find the true dominant species. Is this love? So there you go. That's uh, Cowrie Catchers. Go check it out. I actually did check out the first episode. Oh. Um, she worked for months on this thing. Yeah. Uh, it would just, you know, with a, you and I know what it's like to get a bunch of voices from different people and, and try and put them together for a short story. Uh-huh. But this is for a novel. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I have neither the talent nor the ambition to ever manage anything like that. That's right. Yeah, it makes this uh, novelette that we did today look like Child's Play. Well, Child's Play 2 or 3, one of the bad sequels. Oh, yeah, probably that. Um, But yeah, Abby somehow manages it. I think she was born with a spit curl and the yellow earth sun gives her powers beyond mortal. (laughs) Sweet. All right, so check it out. You know, we've been talking for a long time, and we weren't I, I, supposed to. <laughs> I'm afraid this may be our worst episode ever, but it has nothing to do with this story. This story was really good, right? Uh-huh. It's hard when you top your worst episode ever every week. <laughs> I thought you were just going to say, each story is better than the last. And I was like, oh, cool, hear this. How do we do it? How do you manage? Well, it doesn't happen by accident, sir. It <laughs> takes a lot of planning. That's right. And inspiration, frankly. Oh, wait, OT is the only intelligent one here. All right. Sorry. Go on with your lives. Listen to another podcast where nobody has an opinion. We'll let you go. Until next time. I'm Rich Outfield. 
And I'm Big Anklevich. So we married a squall. Ha, ha, ha. That'll be the day. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Take two. Summoned. Cassie shook her head and cussed under her breath. Darn it. <laughs> For some reason, I don't get that the feeling that that would be the curse word she would choose. Shoot. <laughs> Gall, dern. Excuse me while I whip this out. <laughs> 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 <laughs>